Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Welcome back. Today's show, Julie and I have pulled out the questions that we've been receiving um, from my text, from email, from Instagram. And by the way, if you guys have any questions for us, we read all of them, we answer all of them. And uh, the two best ways really to get hold of us are going to be texting me directly, believe it or not, at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206, or just messaging us on Instagram at timandjulieharris.com. And if you go over on Instagram, you get the added benefit of watching Julie and I um, flagellate ourselves every day at the gym. <laughs> Including today. <laughs> yeah. Even on Friday we do it. That's right. So in any event, if you have any questions or concerns or anything we can be doing to help you in your real estate business, please do forward them our direction. Now, I want to tell you guys something. A lot of the questions that we're going to be reading to you guys today are not – they're based on um, the fear mongers that are back in full force in the real estate market, specifically the people that are trying to get you guys to believe there's going to be a real estate crash, uh, the people that are trying to get you guys to buy products and services in anticipation of a real estate crash. I'm talking about REO lists and things like that. So we're going to be going through with a great bit of detail, explaining to you all, and we're really answering all your specific questions. And then we're going to um, give you tools and a, a way forward so you know what to do and you are no longer going to be, uh, I think, lulled into fear because that's really what's going to happen. Because unfortunately, if you start feeling fear, there is no action that comes after fear. There's complacency that comes after fear. When people feel fear, they don't take action. When people feel fear, they don't, they're don't. they ambitious. They're anticipating tomorrow being worse than today. As a result, they stop doing the things necessary uh, to make it so that tomorrow is indeed better than today. And then they you know, mentally and emotionally and then financially start living underneath their staircase. And that's what happens. Yes, that's it. So again, on today's show, we're going to answer those questions. We do pay attention to your texts, your emails, all of your questions, questions from coaching clients and podcast listeners, all the concerns that you have. We wrote them down. We're going to address that. But in the meantime, as always, thank you for keeping this podcast, the number one daily podcast for real estate professionals like yourself. Remember to like and subscribe so that you can receive every show the second it's released. If you're on iTunes, please give us a five-star review and then share with us why you liked the show. Your continued support and encouragement are, as always, greatly appreciated. And someone, I'll just get to this one first. Someone asked us for yes. a book suggestion. I actually got that one this morning. Mm -hmm. It was a new agent mm -hmm. that listened to our new agent podcast. And um, obviously, I was going to suggest to them they read our book, Harris Rules. Yes. It's available on Audible. It's available at every major bookseller. It's available, obviously, on um, Amazon. Uh, but Audible, we, Julie and I, are you know, we are habitual book listeners. But the other one, honestly, would be um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill which was written in the 20s. So if you're looking for some inspiration, if you're looking for some big picture macro level thinking, uh, those two things, the real estate are a Harris Rules book. It's going to give you the specific roadmap for your real estate business. And I think Napoleon Hill's book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, will give you a philosophy of an approach to life that many of you have been searching for. Now, I will warn you, Napoleon Hill's book was written back in the parlance of the 1920s. And so don't be put off by, if, especially if you listen to it, there's a, a version of it out there of him reading his own book and it's obviously his own voice. And when you hear him talking like people talked back in the 1920s, it is kind of amazing, honestly. It is. I kind of like it. I think it's very authentic. Yeah. And, oh, it is. You know, as an, as authors ourselves, I sort of appreciate that. But yes, uh, just be aware of that. It might take you five minutes to adjust your ear and, you know, really appreciate what they're doing there. And the reason that those two books came to mind, especially Think and Grow Rich, was because Think and Grow Rich was written primarily during the Great Depression. And if there's ever a book that sort of I think will kind of cause your mindset to pivot away from the doom and gloom, it's that book. But then if you remind yourself that that book specifically was written during the Great Depression, then that kind of carries the whole thought forward that here we are, you know, here back then there was ridiculous uh, inflation. There was all kinds of real problems, the Great Dust Bowl, all kinds of things, problem after problem after problem. And it, ha and it lasted generations uh, in the economy and just all kinds of things. Well, then you have this uh, inspirational book that came out that sort of set the 
whole, I, you know, created the whole uh, mindset movement, created the whole self-improvement movement. But really what it did is it really deep dived into what it took and what it takes today to be long-term successful in anything in life. So and it's not just business, though it, there's a big aspect of it that's about making money. It's also about personal life. It's also about health. Really the foundational principles that all of us should be really relying upon um, and reminding ourselves of. Julie and I uh, revisit that book on a regular basis. Yeah, so I was going to mention that, that even if you read that 10 or 15 years ago, some of our listeners will have already been exposed to that. It's really valuable for you to dive back in at other times in your life. I know it has different meaning to us now than the first or second or third time that we read or listened to it. Yep, for sure. And we started listening to that when we were, well, reading it when we were in high school. Yes. It's yeah. a great book. So yep. check All it right. Out. So let's go on to your questions. Now, I want to start out, and Julie and I don't have these in a particular order because, like I said, we've just been working on this on and off really the past two weeks. And, you know, Julie was working on it independent of me, and then we would sort of gather notes at the end of the day, and then we'd realize that we were sort of dealing with the same questions. So some of this is not going to be in the perfect cohesive order of the questions, so just bear with us. Uh, Julie did spend a lot of time doing some specific research, and here's what our goal is of this uh, podcast is to educate you is to motivate you and then to get you into action. Because what's going to happen again, I'm going to repeat this, is if you're starting to feel fearful, you will not take action. You will ensure, you will lock in that your tomorrow will be worse than your today. And you have complete control of that depending on the actions you choose to take. But we're going to help you cut through some of the BS that's out there. So let's talk about the BS first. Yes, indeed. I have been seeing a lot of videos on YouTube. I've been seeing a lot of emails. And, this, and, and if you're new in real estate, this same type of, I think, um, fear mongering, really, this uh, fear porn, mm -hmm. it comes out every year about this, uh, about this time. And sometimes it usually hits uh, fourth quarter of the previous year. And what it's doing is there's people that are in the business of selling stuff to you guys, as are we, but they're in the business of selling stuff to you guys based on something that's not based in reality or based on facts. So when you stumble across somebody who's trying to trip you up into believing that there's going to be some sort of housing crash 2.0, don't just assume the person knows what the hell they're talking about. And I'll tell you guys a funny story. <laughs> this is a funny story, actually. I got the – you remember – so there was a video that was floating around last year that was specifically talking about – I think actually, you know, now I think about this. I think it started the fourth quarter of the previous year. Mm -hmm. And it was an incredibly well done video and it was great narration and it was – somebody spent a lot of money making yeah. this. It I remember this. It had really good production quality. It did, exactly. Yeah. It wasn't just a bunch of video clips that somebody put together from, you know, something. Yes. It was it really well done. And it was totally and completely believable. And the whole premise of it is – Obviously, there's a great housing apocalypse that's about to happen and what you should be doing about it and all this. And, and I was – Julie and I both watched it and we e emailed – You know, we were getting on, hit by you guys saying, oh my gosh, you got to watch this video. What the hell is going on? What does this person know? And so what Julie and I did is we watched the video. We picked up on what we've suspected to be a um, – let's just call it an era of bullshit. <laughs> but then we weren't convinced that we – you know, we – the facts and the figures and the assumptions and the conclusions were all definitely agenda ridden, but we weren't sure what their agenda was. And so what Julie and I did is we, we went to, I think we went to uh, who's it or whatever it is that where you can look up who the owner of a URL is. Mm. And that's what we did. And so we went and found out who owned the website, who created the video. And then we f had to follow, uh, you know, links. It did, it went, it basically it took me about an hour to figure it out, but here's where I landed. I landed in a preppers website. So there was somebody that was uh, in the business, and there's nothing wrong with the business of prepping. I don't confuse what I'm saying here. Um, I sure as hell don't want to pick fights with preppers. <laughs> no, prep, preppers meaning, you know, preparing for some kind of apocalypse or yeah. event or, you know, having your own house fortified, that sort of prepping. Well, actually, it was more than that, Jules. Mm -hmm. It was somebody that was trying to sell MRI, uh, MREs, mm -hmm. some, you know, prepared food. Someone was trying to convince you to basically have a big stock of water and all these other – fundamentally, it resonates, right? It may, makes sense, especially after oh, yeah. the last 10 years. Absolutely. But this business was in the business of selling people – uh, stuff that was designed for an apocalypse in mm -hmm. essence, worst case scenario. And um, what, so if you watch this video, you are going to feel, especially in the real estate industry, but this video wasn't just designed to, um, you know, work on real estate agents. It was designed to convince the whole public that there was a real estate crash coming. The real estate crash then was supposed to remind everyone back of 2007 and 2008, that kind of thing. You guys get it? 
And then you are then going to, after having watched the video, think to yourself, this is the goal of the video. Otherwise, why the hell they have made it? I need to somehow fortify myself and my family, which let's be clear, not a bad idea. We're not sponsored by any, you know, no. sort of preparation companies. But if we are, or if we were, we you know, or anyone wants to, uh, us to be, we're receptive because there is validity into being prepared for the worst and hoping for the best, a hundred percent. But this video was definitely designed to cause a whole crap ton of fear in people, and I'm promising you it did. And then Julie and I went and did some homework on it. We mentioned it on a podcast. We said this is what the motivation of it was. But what was fascinating to me wasn't that there was somebody who had created a very slick marketing piece. What was fascinating to me was that there were so many agents that didn't really think through what, what the motivation of the message was. And those people are the same people that are going to be essentially not thinking when – other, uh, essentially, I'm trying not to sound political, sure. but they're not thinking. They're basically just absorbing information and over-trusting the sources of the information. They're not actually using their own in uh, intellects and intuition to really ask themselves whether whatever it makes sense. That video being an example. Okay, here's this video convincing you that the sky is falling. Did you actually take any time to examine the facts that this video was throwing at you? Had you done that, you would have realized the facts were all basically misconstrued or straight up BS. And so that's what I want you guys to keep in mind as we're going through these points. When people are trying to create fear within you, what is their motivation? What's in it for you, Mr. Fear Monger, Mr. Fear Porn Creator? What's in it for you? What do you get by me feeling fear the way you're obviously trying to get me to feel fear? You guys get it? So keep yeah. that in mind as we go through these points. That's right. And when you guys come across some of that, do what you did, which is send us that and say, what do you think about this? Because we do do independent research we before do. we roll anything out. And, you know, I think it's especially pernicious when it's done so well because you're less likely. You know, we, we watch stuff on different channels sometimes and we'll come across something and we're like, oh, that's a bunch of crap. That's just thrown together little clips. Sometimes it's obvious, but when it's done really well, it's not so obvious. So, you know, send it to us and we'll help you with that. So the first question we've been getting a lot from you guys, and we're going to not spend a lot of time on this, but it is what is inflation? Um, and this is something that Julie and I – copy. This is something that Julie and I have been talking about on this podcast for going on. Well, honestly, we started talking about this before we were officially doing a podcast. We've done, I don't even know how many shows at this point, but if you include our webinars, over 10,000 podcasts easily, including the webinars. Yep. So there was this webinar we did a long time ago with a Canadian. This was after the housing crash, right when QE started to roll out. And he's you know, a Canadian economist, and he explained inflation really well. Julie's got a very drilled down explanation of it. But here's what I want you guys to all understand. All, again, all these points are about to read to you. We are going to give you the facts and the figures on them, but don't just don't just level off there. Be intellectually curious to continue to do your own homework on this. And then you will discover that there are the greatest fortunes of humanity have always been made during the greatest times of change. All right, Julie, so let's talk. What is inflation? Yes. Okay. Tell so me where to go. Down, keep on. Uh, We're using two parts of notes because we both worked on this independently. There's, If you keep going, it'll actually say. All right, just tell me. Okay, right there. Okay. All right. So what is inflation? Those of you who like to take notes, this is the time to get started. A general increase in prices and fall in the purchasing value of money. I'm going to read that again because we're also going to talk about the difference between that and appreciation. So a general increase in prices and a fall in the purchasing value of money. The inflation rate year over year shows you how much prices of goods and services change when you compare those years. Now, the Federal Reserve has a target of achieving 2% inflation for a healthy economy. That's what we look at as kind of a normal rate of inflation. We're currently experiencing somewhere in the range of 7 to 9% inflation, depending on who you talk to. Some people are saying even more than that, double digits. But that's year over year, which is indeed the highest increase in 40 years. That's why you're noticing things. We mentioned this a couple of days ago. You're noticing things like, obviously, gas prices are, uh, I think they've doubled in the past 90 days or something like that. You're noticing fewer uh, or less product for the same price. Lots of stuff like that. So uh, you'll notice that in your grocery bill. What's the difference between appreciation and inflation? I get this a lot from agents. I think you do too, because we're used to talking about house appreciation. Appreciation is the increase in monetary value. Appreciation is when the intrinsic value of something like a house increases. Now that's not the same as price or cost. We're talking about actual value as in something grows more valuable. So how would something actually gain value or appreciate? Just so we keep all of our terms and words straight. 
Uh, what would cause that? Increased demand, not enough supply. We've been seeing that. Additional value could be discovered on your property, like oil or developed road frontage, adding utilities where there weren't any before. Or maybe Amazon, Google, or Tesla decide to relocate 3,000 employees into your town and there aren't enough homes to go around, supply and demand. So appreciation and inflation can actually happen at the same time. But appreciation reflects a change in the actual property itself. Now, real estate investors don't mind inflation so much because the value of their property increases while their payment stays the same. And if it's rental property, rents go up. Okay, that is really, really important what you heard Julie just read to you. And this is the reason why you are in a blessed industry. Um, so real estate inflation or appreciation, would call what you would like, in 2022 is anticipated to go up by 16%. Not That's not Tim and Julie saying it. That's Goldman Sachs saying it. Now, the inflation rate or appreciation rate, whichever you'd like, but they're not the same, but conflate them all you'd like, um, next year is supposed to be some, uh, close to 10%. But if you add the inflation, the appreciation rate over the last three years, and if you assume that they're correct about 2023, then you're looking at homes having appreciated in the three years at the end of 2023 by basically 50%. In some markets, that's already happened. In some markets, that happened after you know 18 or 24 months. Now, Here's where the fear mongers are going to sneak, uh, sneak in. I remember back in 2006, there was the exact same situation. Houses went up and all of a sudden houses went back down again. And just because they went up, they're going to go down again. That is bullshit. And when you hear somebody say that, you ask them, why would that be true? And then you say, why wouldn't that be true? They will have no answer because they haven't thought about it. Because the reality of it is just because something goes up in value does not mean it comes back down in value. You want me to give you an example? You guys can do this. Go Google yourself. Look at the inflation rate over the last, like since 1978, when we went off the gold standard. I think that was 78. Was that 78? Let me remember. definitely 70s. Yeah, it was somewhere in there. And then you will see the inflation rate took off and the prices did not come back down. And the houses that you are buying, that people are purchasing now, will not be worth less tomorrow. Unlike the housing boom. Now, here's the all the you know those of you who have assets, not just real estate, by the way. Virtually everything's going up in value right now, um, and we can talk forever about some of the insanity that's happening in the automotive industry. I've been studying that. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. But anyway, here's the punchline: inflation. Uh, if you have appreciation in your house, but everything else is staying priced the same, then you actually have, you are creating more uh, buying power for yourself, hypothetically. If you're to sell that house or if you're to take out a second mortgage, maybe that's convoluted, but you guys get the gist of it. Your house is appreciating in value, but everything else is not increasing in cost. Well, then you actually get the benefit, but if everything else is increasing in cost simultaneously and your house is appreciating or inflating, then you really don't get the benefit because your house might be more expensive uh, and worth more and you on paper might have greater net worth, but so are all the other expenses that it takes for you to feed and care for that house or your family or yourself. So when inflation is what we were watching, and this was two years ago, is we were waiting to see if inflation was going to enter in the overall market. We certainly saw it in real estate. Everybody did, though they were calling it appreciation. Mm -hmm. And we started to see it in other things that people were, uh, you know, cars, used cars, all this type of thing. But now you see it in everything. Julie read a very interesting article. I don't think you included it, but it's just worth mentioning to summarize mm -hmm. how the um, Frito-Lay people making dur uh, Doritos. Uh, yes. Uh, let's see. They... This is on, under the category of sneaky ways that inflation uh, can get you. But let's be careful. Businesses do not increase prices because of – they have to increase prices because of inflation because it costs them more to make the product. It costs them more to ship that's the right. product. Don't be believing the politicized BS that's out there about inflation. Inflation is not happening from evil companies. If you guys are business owners, Julie and I are business owners, the last thing you want to do is raise prices – um, and make yourself less competitive. If you, in a real situation where you, if you have the ability to, you want to lower your prices, thus making it so you're more competitive. When someone says, the, when especially politicians say, you're going to, you know, the greedy companies are the reason that there's inflation. Yeah. They're, they're windfall tax they're and all this other crap. They're scamming yeah. consumers. Do not believe it. That person has an agenda. The reason that the prices are going up is because the producers are having to actually spend more to create the product. Now, the story Julie is about to tell you, here's what's happening. In all these inflationary cycles, and Julie and I studied these going back to as really as far as we could, what we discovered was uh, producers will, uh, you know, the Frito-Lay guys, let's say, will keep the prices the same, but they'll have to re reduce the quantity of what's in the product. 
In other words, they don't want the product to all of a sudden go from three dollars to you know sixteen dollars because you'll stop buying it mm -hmm. and they'll be less competitive. But what they can do to basically make it so they still make profit margins is they have to reduce not the quality necessarily, but the quantity, and then followed sometimes by the uh, uh, quality. But what you're going to see next is you're going to see smaller portions, which frankly most humans could actually. That's, <laughs> that's probably there's okay. no downside in that. Yeah. But then you're going to see rising prices. That's what's going to happen this year. You're going to see your when you go to the grocery store, you bring those groceries home. Your family's going through them, and maybe it took seven days, and now they're going through it in six. Well, soon they're going to be going through it in three, all the while the prices are going up. That is what's going to happen with inflation. That's what's happening next. Well, that's right. And your example about the chips, right, is uh, I think it was Frito-Lay decided that rather than raising prices, to your point, they would instead take five chips out of the bag per bag. And so you think, well, that's not that much. That's only a few ounces, right? But the, the article that I read calculated times however many millions of bags they sell worldwide and it does save them money it does well it doesn't it's that saves way they them don't money. charge you more that way they don't have to raise the prices That's my point. but yeah. this is happening across all businesses and all industry but notice when you start reading articles mm -hmm. where they're trying to spin the producers as being evil and trying to basically make a lot of extra tax and all, or rather a lot of extra profit when you see that, that is a politicized opinion of what's actually happening. What's actually happening is we're having inflation that's caused by, we can say it's the pandemic, we can say it's the war in Eastern Europe, we can certainly say it's um, supply chain, but really what it's been created by was an abundance of money that's been pumped into the economy. If you don't believe me, look at the simple fact. That's the reason that the Fed is having to rise, raise interest rates. And Julie and I are going to get into this when we answer more specific questions. I don't want to jump on any of your future points. That's okay. Do you want to go back to our questions or do you want to do this one? Um, yeah. No, let's go back to future th questions because that's, okay. that's covered in there. All right. Yep. Let me check all my equipment. Okay, good. We're good. <laughs> yes. We had equipment problems yesterday. It was very frustrating. All right. What effect – see, that worked out. Yep. So what effects uh, – what effect do higher mortgage and interest rates have on the market? Now, I want to start before you read your example. Mm -hmm. um, interest rate – the Fed overnight lending rate went from effectively zero. Uh, they're projected that the Fed overnight interest rates by – did you talk about that? Yes. Okay. So we're, we're talking – and again, we're also talking about watch your headlines and don't be sucked into it. Beware of those things that, that they're trying to freak you out. So let's take a look at how mortgage rates are or are not related to the federal funds rate adjusting. Reported by United Mortgage Brokers, Inc. yesterday, here's a quote, tomorrow the Fed is expected to raise the target federal funds rate. That is not the mortgage interest rate. The federal funds rate by a quarter percent, the first such increase since December 2018. The move has been telegraphed for months, if not longer, so it will come as no surprise to about anybody. It will push the key short-term borrowing rate from a range of 0 to 0.25% up to close to 0.5%, uh, a half point, which is still rock bottom. However, the Fed may increase this key rate another six times in 2022. You guys are all talking. I hear them doing it constantly. I see it online. Oh, the, the mortgage interest rates are going up by that much. No, we're talking about the key uh, Fed rate. And yes, they are saying that they'll raise it six more times. Now, we don't know if that's true or not because of the war in Europe and all that kind of impact. Uh, but the plan is intended to cool inflation and avoid an overheated economy. This is basically the rate in which the Fed lends to banks, okay? But Julie just said something that's really important. The Fed rate, the overnight rate or the short-term interest rate, does not dictate what the mortgage rates are. Generally speaking, they do follow the same trajectory, but you, there are plenty of examples where the overnight Fed rate uh, has gone one direction and mortgage interest rates have gone the other. So again, That's these right. are people that do not know what they're talking about that are telling you that the Fed controls mortgage rates. That is not true. The Fed does not control mortgage rates. Stop saying it. Stop believing it. Correct. When you say somebody, when you hear somebody say that, you you have should have a red flag go off in your mind that this person is not very not knowledgeable. That's right. Now, it is still true that there is some relationship there, but the Fed is not controlling mortgage interest rates. Now, rates are going up. That's true. It's hard for them not to, considering how absolutely outrageously low they were. Mortgage rates increased this week to about 4.4% on average as inflation begins to take hold. The average 30-year fixed mortgage rate went up a quarter point from last week and has risen about a percent since January of 2022. Now, Here's what you should be caring about and how to handle that potential objection you may be getting from your buyers and sellers. What does this translate to in terms of payment? 
So taking the national average of about 400,000, putting 20% down, you'd have a loan amount of about 320,000. Now the payment with a 3.4% rate is 1400 bucks. If the rate on the same loan goes to 4.4%, a point higher, the payment is 1885. And at 5%, the payment goes to about 2000 a month. So here's your question. If your buyer is motivated enough to purchase the same home, if the payment goes up between four and 600 bucks, if they're not, they might not have been that serious or strong of a borrower anyway. And here's the, here's the thing you also take, have to take into consideration that the simple fact is, is that the rents are going to increase. And this is the reason you guys have to be paying attention to all of this jib jab, uh, because at the end of the day, their housing costs, unless they're living in the basement of their, their parents' yeah. house, their housing cost is going to increase. Rents are going up double digits. This is a they're, they're actually going up at a faster rate than right. anything you would see in mortgages. It's it's That's what's true. What's never happened in Julie and I's career before, at least not on a national level, is where rents are actually more expensive than what a mortgage payment would be. Julie used the example of 20%, but the numbers still work to the benefit of someone buying, even if the down payment's only 5 or 10%. That's true. Because... Because, okay, so let's take that same home that's projected to inflate by most economists in price by about 16%, adding 64,000 worth of equity for that homeowner. That's in just one year. Let's say their interest rate is that higher 5%, making the payment 2,000 a month. 64,000 in new equity minus the 24,000 in payments, which are, by the way, locked in. Assuming they did a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which That's you should right. be telling all your buyers, do not yeah. do adjustable rates. 4.4% is still a steal of a mortgage rate. 5% is still still That's a steal. Right. If you have uh, inflation that's uh, arguably at you know, seven to nine percent, but it's probably realistically more like ten or fifteen percent, and you have a mortgage uh, uh, interest rate that's say less than five percent, the inflation on the property, or if you guys are getting confused, the appreciation on the property will more than cover the cost of owning the home. It'll more than cover. So Julie's example, got, read that again because okay. it's really critical. So we're going to take that same home as the example, and let's say it's projected to rise in price, a combination of inflation and appreciation. So after by 12. 16 so they bought it at the beginning of this year for yep. 400 grand. It goes mm -hmm. up by 16%. At the end of the year, it's worth $64,000 more equity for the homeowner. The carry the carry uh, cost, not including the down payment on the house, was essentially $24,000. Mm -hmm. So that means they come out ahead in one year of $40,000. That's right. That's better. Now compare that to rent even with these higher interest rates. So again, remember that just because the Fed raises short-term borrowing rates, it does not control mortgage interest rates. And in fact, there are multiple factors that affect each person's mortgage interest rate. The economy is only one of those many factors, and you guys know this. Credit, ratios, type of loan, points paid, lender overlays, and other factors combined to form the actual rate you close at. That's why the rate that you closed at is not the same as your neighbors. Okay, we're going to get to a next More question. Questions. Right. Oh, by the way, we did a great podcast with Peter Schiff all about inflation. We want to move into the weeds as far as more questions so we get all these bases covered. Yep. But do go back and listen to the podcast with Peter Schiff. Uh, it was fantastic. You can actually just Google it. I think it's been uh, it's been viewed on YouTube probably 250,000 times. We put it up there twice. Um, and as far as the podcast itself, I bet you it's been downloaded easily 250,000 times mm -hmm. now. All right. So let's, we have now answered your questions. What is inflation? We have answered your question. Number two was what effect do higher mortgage interest rates have on the market? Well, let's do answer that question a little bit more. So the interest rates are not going up in a meaningful way this year. And we do not think the bottom line is that it'll have a meaningful impact on the housing market on a whole. People are still going to want to purchase real estate. And furthermore, even though the Fed has said they're going to come out with all these additional rate hikes, we personally do not think that will happen. Why? Because the Fed looks for reasons not to actually raise interest rates because they are, the Fed has uh, essentially two jobs. Uh, control inflation and basically prevent recessions. And there is going to there is now brewing a recession. A recession is two quarters of negative GDP. Now, what does that mean to you? It means that you're going to have a uh, customers, buyers who are not necessarily going to be as financially secure. Maybe they're worried about their jobs or whatever because of the fact that the rising interest rates cause maybe a recession and maybe they work at a business that makes, you know, I don't even know what home windows for homes or whatever. And all of a sudden the window uh, orders drop off a little bit and that employer starts saying, well, maybe I don't need all these employees. 
Those are the types of effects of a recession. That's what, what hypothetically could affect the housing market in a meaningful way. What part of the segment, what segment of the market will that take out? Primarily the first time buyers. So the first time buyers most likely are gonna have to stay renters. So if you're working with first buy time buyers now, tell them to lock in a damn house now. Because if they have any, um, if they do for some, they're always gonna have a housing expense. Just get that clear in your head. So even if they, for example, have to work at one job making 60000 and they lose that job, now they have to work at Home Depot and make 45000 if they still will have, whether they're making a mortgage payment or paying a rent, they're going to have a fixed monthly cost. Doesn't it make sense that they could keep a house that most likely will cost them less per month than renting? Don't believe these people telling you there's going to be a wave of homes coming for sale because people can't afford their homes. Because there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Question, Question number four. Will the housing market crash as a result? No, stop saying that. Okay. Well, you and I talked last night about any time we were talking about this podcast and you said, you know, they need to pay attention to any time somebody says, well, this time's just like last time. Or they start out the conversation by saying whatever inflates must pop. Yeah, and you ask the follow-up question, well, why is that? Why would it and why wouldn't it? And nine times out of ten, that's the end of the conversation. Well, they don't know, they haven't, they, they don't know they what don't they're know talking about. They don't have the experience. They don't. Yes. Honestly, they haven't taken the time to become educated. Um, but really what they're trying to do is they're fear-mongering. They're, mm -hmm. they're fear, they're fear uh, porn creators is that's what they're right. doing. They're fear porn. And, they, and that's what they're all – so, that when, again, why would that be true? The market must go up. It's going to go back down again. Why would it be true that the, the inflation is going to cause – uh, a recession. Well, I can kind of, I can work that out of my head. That sort of makes sense. But why would it be true that that would cause a, a, some sort of huge housing crash? That's where the logic ends because there is a record. We didn't research it, but I think it's 22 trillion mm -hmm. of equity in real estate right now. That's so let, let's just say it's the guy that was working at the window making fa uh, factory and making $60,000 a year. Now he's got to go work at Home Depot or wherever he's going to go work. And now he's going to make say $45,000 a year. Did we mention the fact that guys owned his house for two years? And he's got essentially his greatest bit of net worth equity in that property. And he maybe has $150,000, $200,000. Are you telling me that guy's going to walk away from that equity position? Held the no, he's not. That's and, and, and Tim, sorry, he also has a job. That's totally different than last time around. That's what's different about the, the before is people didn't have equity. Now they have equity. What's more, and this is something that we um, have researched as well, and that people want to say it's just like last time. And these people are trying to sell you lists of REO companies and secret sauce to get on REO companies. Well, here's a simple fact. Virtually every mortgage in the United States is now more or less directly controlled by the government, especially after Dodd-Frank and some of the other mortgage regulations. And you saw during the pandemic, everyone that was able or everyone that heard was able to put their house on forbearance, didn't have to make a mortgage payment for six months, 12 months, in some cases even longer. Do you really think that the bank and the government, no matter if it's a Democrat or Republican that's running the, you know, basically running the country, do you really think there ever is going to be a big wave of, of foreclosures that happen in a meaningful way? Last time when Obama was president and when there were all, all of a sudden the train started to leave the station with their REOs. And then what did Obama do? He, that was it. There was now mortgage workouts. There were short sales. Mm -hmm. There were all types of things. But the biggest difference is, is the amount of equity there in people's homes. So in order for these doomsday people to be correct that there's going to be some sort of 2007, 2008 housing crash, that means homes would have to depreciate in some markets by more than 50%. Explain to me why that would happen. It's not going to happen. And even if they, even let's say, even if they depreciated by 20%, people still have more than 20% equity in their homes. The thing I was trying to say before also is we had higher unemployment back then. Yep. So people would have to sell their house because they couldn't make the payment. So we have two things going in our favor. One is that clearly the government will step in and save that because they don't want that to happen either. And secondly, if you lose your job today, pretty much everybody in the world is hiring. And go back to what Julie and I are saying here. You're always going to have a housing expense. Back in 2006, 2007, everybody was doing ninja loans. No income, no job, no blah, blah, blah. Everyone was doing variable rate mortgages. Nobody was locking in long-term 30 rate mortgage. One of the biggest reasons that the first dominoes started to fall, a new century out in Southern California was the first subprime that failed, was because those adjustable rate mortgages were all coming due. They did short-term 
um, subprime mortgages for two and three years, and those subprime mortgages were all basically maturing, and then the people were uh, the adjustables were coming up, and they were having to adjust to a higher payment, and the people could not afford the higher payment, and they did not have any equity in the property. And then what had happened because there were no standards to get mortgages, basically, is that people had bought dozens and dozens and dozens of houses, and then they didn't have any equity, and they probably couldn't even qualify for the higher payment anyway. Uh, and they weren't, weren't able to rent it. That's what happened. It was a series of things that is not even remotely in place now. So if anyone's trying to sell you into the idea that there's a housing crash, they haven't done their homework. If you guys want to discuss this, if you would like to debate it, we'd love to have a, a contrarian a perspective on this because uh, at present, all we're you know constantly having to have this conversation with people. And I wonder, why do you, listener, want there to be a housing crash? Right. You got to go to yourself and you have to ask yourself and be introspective. If you're so attracted to the idea that there's going to be a zombie apocalypse and there's going to be blood on the streets and there's going to be. A, why? What is about you that wants you wants the, your future to be bleak like that? You're looking for and then looking for reinforcement of the belief that there's going to be a housing crash. Why? Because you think you're going to be able to scoop up a bunch of houses at a discount. Well, if you have a bunch of cash, that's a great opportunity for you. But I bet you don't. And by the way, back in 2007, 2008, people couldn't get credit. People lost their HELOCs. I remember very clearly, again, you know, Julie and I had big coaching business, coaching clients all over the place. Everybody was a real estate investor. And, and everyone, <laughs> everyone. Was, and everyone was basically, you know, buying properties using home equity from the previous property or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But I remember Bank of America, and some of you guys will think I'm making this up. I'm not. Bank of America sent out a nice little email, nice in air quotes, and that basically said, your home equity line was, say, $500,000, and now it's nothing. We've canceled it. It's frozen. Or, or it's, it's frozen. Or it's basically been reduced to whatever your outstanding balance is. These are the types of things that happen in a housing uh, correction and housing crash. But nobody knew it was going to happen back then, or at least the banks weren't prepared. Now they are. And I, again, Julie and I are talking to people at the highest levels, asking if they're seeing any sort of real reason to believe that prices are going to fall or that there's going to be a big wave of people not making payments and all that. And all of them are saying no. And by the way, all the people that we're going to, to ask this, uh, these questions are in the business of benefiting from if they doomed either the REO companies and the asset management companies and investors who made a lot of money back then. All of them are saying there's no signs of it even remotely happening. Granted, there are pockets here and there, and there always will be. But as far as a national housing crash, it's not in the cards. If Julie and I thought it was going to happen, if for some reason there was an alien invasion or something, whatever, we are going to be the first to tell you, and we're going to back it up with facts, not just hype. That's right. And Tim, one of the reasons I think that some of our listeners sort of I don't know if they would admit it after listening to this podcast, but kind of want some sort of housing correction or crash is because they are still resisting the idea that they have to work harder in this market for, especially for their buyers. We talked all this week about being a listing agent, right? So agents would say to you, well, what if we wake up tomorrow and there's a whole bunch more inventory? Won't that cause prices to go down? No, the buyers are going to back out of buying homes because of the fact they're fearful of catching a falling knife. So again, this goes not. This goes back to Lafix. You got to be really careful what you hope for, yeah. because the harm that happens to humans as a result of what happened in 2007 isn't just the loss of equity. There is horrible things that happen to uh, humanity because of the of the housing crash. People, all kinds of depressing things that I don't want to even nope. talk about. And I won't. But the reality of it is, is do not wish for that to happen. That is not. And if you're wishing for that to happen, you maybe need to be some, do some introspection, meditation and praying about why, why you're hoping for that to manifest. Because it might not it, it might not manifest on a well, it won't on a grand scale, mm -hmm. but you're going to have it manifest in your life. So you got to really think that through a little philosophical. Well, it moment. is pretty misguided if you really <laughs> totally spin is. that thought up. All right. Next question is uh, and this one we're hearing a lot, especially from our EXP friends, where there'll be a big drop off in real estate agents. And we don't believe there will be. And I know this sounds counterintuitive. But here's the reason why. And this is the reason why it's completely different. Real estate, as let's just start from the easy answers. Real, go into Instagram and put in the hashtag, hashtag realtor and look at the pictures. That's all I have to say. 
Real estate as a career path has completely changed. You can call it the Bravo vacation, Bravo vacation of uh, real estate. The uh, Essentially, it's become a semi, which is amazing to even say this out loud. I almost have to laugh. <laughs> glamorous industry to get into. I it's know. an aspirational industry to get into. Before, being a real estate practitioner was essentially your fallback to your fallback to your fallback. Now, people, especially millennials, are getting into it, and they're really wanting to make careers of it. And they're seeing it as careers. So the mindset about uh, real estate has completely changed. So just to think that there's going to be a drop off in agents because um, you know there's some consternation in the housing market, inflation, rising interest rates, I think doesn't really take into a, uh, consideration how much real estate as an industry has changed. And furthermore, you guys think about this. How many of you listening right now did your pre-licensing during COVID? How many of you right now are thinking about getting real estate licenses or, or got your real estate licenses years ago because of the fact that you wanted, as the kids are fond of saying, a side hustle or an alternative way of creating income or a backup in case the primary doesn't work out? People nowadays are wired differently. And this has completely changed in the real estate industry again. So the other reason that we think that there's not going to be any sort of precipitous drop in real estate, even if we go into a recession, is because we're in a recession, people are going to be looking for more ways to create financial security in their lives. That's right. To invest in tried and true assets like housing. So, and think about that, guys. It doesn't make sense there'll be a big drop off. Of, now, someone's going to say, well, it's because they don't want to pay their NAR dues. They don't want to pay this or they don't want to pay the other thing. Well, that doesn't really make any sense to me because if someone is you know, wrestling with uh, spending a few hundred dollars just to stay a member of National Association of Realtors, I don't, you know, they probably, I don't even- They weren't that serious anyway. Well, not even not that serious, but- that's just not something that even makes sense because people can easily come up with $500, put it on a credit card. Not to mention the fact that the average commission is massively higher than it used to be. Yeah. So if you're thinking about getting your license, you know, even five years ago, you might be thinking, well, gosh, you know, I'd have to sell at least 20 houses to make a living. Well, probably it's like five to 10 for most people. So I'm going to go back to the question I asked before. Those of you who believe there's going to be a, you know, big Hunger Games situation with real estate agents, yeah. I'm going to ask a big calling, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen these memes. It's, there's a lot of them are funny. I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> but you tell me why you want that, why you want that to be true. You tell me why, listener, why you want the, there to be a big drop off in agents. What is it about your thinking about your future that's causing you to want that to happen? Because you shouldn't want that to happen. You shouldn't want there are a bunch of people to get real estate licenses and have uh, essentially experienced failure. You shouldn't want that to happen. And if you do want that to happen, the only reason you'd want that to happen is because you think that's going to essentially increase your odds of being able to make money because you have less competition. But the very fact that you're wanting that tells should tell you that you will always have that uh feeling that there's too much competition. You're not taking the right actions opposed to hoping that a whole bunch of other people suffer. So you can, you know, win. you should instead figure out why you're losing or why you're not winning at the level in which you wish you had been uh, winning at. And that goes to skills always. And by the way, we are entering into without a doubt, a skills-based market. Not in a meaningful way yet, I have to say. No, truthfully. I think we're right on the edge of it, though. We're right on the edge. We, it does feel like we're entering into yes. a sort of, a, like, why do all these little, uh, you know, social networking teams, why does all this fancy, shiny stuff exist? Um, it exists only in one kind of market. It exists at the level in which it has. Mm -hmm. It's when the cash flow is, e is happening um, easily. Because what happens is cash flow covers up mistakes. So if you're spending money on something, branding, marketing, SEO, whatever you're doing, and it's not working, because you have so much money coming in, you're continuing to pay the bill and you just say it's a business business expense. And so that means all these other businesses that you've never held accountable to actually achieving results for you, they're going to go out of business when you start realizing, well, that is not a necessary expense. That probably would never have made any sense. And then all these pretty shiny guys selling you widgets and gals selling you widgets, the branding and the marketing, all the rest of it, they're going to go where they always go every time there's a change in the housing market, wherever they came from. Or they're probably going to get real estate licenses, you know, real, reality. That's true, which brings us full circle right back to having to be a proactive listing agent so that you can indeed control your own destiny. You know, Tim, at the beginning of this year, I had a funny conversation with one of our coaching clients that's been with us a long time, been coachable, systematized, you know, follows what we coach. And and she said, I was asking her about the difference between her gross and her net. And she's like, well, what do you mean? It's pretty simple. <laughs> I, I, I don't spend that much. <laughs> and she's like, well, it's about 90%, which you don't really hear that often, right? And I said, 
let me take a look at that profit and loss. And you know, she's a very, very proactive lead generator. She has some very developed spokes. We talk about spokes in the wheel. And it really was that simple. And in, in fact, a lot of our conversations are about that. She's like, you know, I, I was pitched by this. What do you think about that? And, and we talk about, well, what do you think you're going to get from that? And it, it always comes back to you're already getting that from what you're doing. So keep the money in your pocket. If anything, a recession is going to cause a dramatic increase in the number of people getting into real estate, not just in the United States, but globally. For all the reasons we've stated and more. Definitely. And Julie and I could vamp on this forever. Now, 10 years ago, frankly, maybe 15 years ago, I would have not said that. But now we feel like everything has changed. This new generation of people that are coming into the real estate industry that are not like previous generations. They're not. They're not wired the same. They've come up during, you know, a recession, a major housing crash. They've they've come up, you know, experiencing a housing boom. They've come up seeing real estate become something glamorous and aspirational. But in addition to that, they've also come up seeing that real estate is perhaps the greatest wealth creator known to man outside of maybe the stock market. All right, we're going to go on to the next uh, question. Uh, da, 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 did we do that one? All right, what should a real estate broker, agent, and team be doing now in anticipation of a changing economy? And I'll answer that succinctly, sure. I think. Yep. Basically, go through every single expense you, that you have. And if there's a, uh, not a direct relationship or correlation between the expense and the amount of net profit you're making from said expense, stop doing it urgently. Mm -hmm. That's it. And that means you're going to have to really have a coming to Jesus session with yourself about a lot of the marketing and branding stuff. Because the marketing and branding stuff, you cannot uh, attribute to anything other than um, ego, uh, you know, essentially a glamorification, you know, if that's a word, right? True. Because that ultimately, you cannot say uh, definitively that this is going to, that spending money on essentially uh, making yourself look like you're more successful than you are or marketing your brand or any of the rest of it, you cannot say definitively that spent expense resulted in this profit. You convince yourself that that marketing expense and that branding expense uh, essentially built up or reinforced my other uh, activities that did lead directly to profit. For example, you contacted the centers of influence and past clients. That person sent you a referral. That referral maybe saw that you did some marketing thing. In your mind, you're going to say, the marketing thing got me the business. It did not. The referral got you the business. You're going to call a, um, a, a for sale by owner. Please call it for sale by owner. The for sale by owner is going to list the house with you. You're going to walk into the house and you're going to see a stack of your previous just sold cards sitting on their table that they've been saving. We used to have this experience. It was yep. pretty funny. And then you'll convince yourself, I got this call because of that stack of sold cards. Nope, you got the call because you called them. They weren't going to call you otherwise. Now, did you get the listing easily, more easily because you had the postcards? Maybe. But you got the appointment because of the fact that you made the effort. You were proactive with your lead generation. Do you guys see the fallacy in what many of you are believing? Believe what we're telling you right now because it's the truth. You need to eliminate anything that you cannot directly relate to a profit um, creation creating endeavor. Cut it out. And that's going to include some staff. That's going to include some buyer's agents. That's going to include some office rent. That's going to include virtually a lot of the things that, again, you've been paying for without holding accountable for for results because your cash flow has been so good. One of the biggest uh, winners in a changing market, in a recession, and guys, hear me out, it's going to be eXp Realty. Because there are going to be so many teams, so many small and medium-sized brokerages, mostly the mom and pops, that are going to look at their fixed costs. They're going to look at their office rents. They're going to look at all these legacy expenses. And they're going to say, we do not want to have to endure these expenses anymore in a changing real estate market. Maybe they've experienced a changing market back in 07 and 08, don't want to go through it again. you know. And so they're realizing that they're fearful of what's going to happen and they want to get rid of expenses. Before, they didn't really have a viable alternative. It was be independent, be a mom and pop, or join a franchise. Those were your two options. But now you have this hybrid version, which is essentially EXP Realty. It is a national real estate brokerage. It does provide you multiple streams of income, including revenue share. The commission splits are going to be better than what you're going to find anywhere else. And the opportunities, again, to create passive income are like nothing we've ever seen before. Julie and I consider EXP Realty the eighth greatest wonder of the world that's just carved out specifically for real estate agents. So if you want to know what a big winner is going to be in the real estate industry, EXP Realty is designed for a changing market. It's designed for people that are actually looking uh, down the barrel at rising expenses and perhaps 
leveling off or falling revenue. That is what eXp is perfect for. Of course, Julie and I are associated with eXp Realty, and we'd love the opportunity to have you be part of our eXp family. If you're interested in joining eXp Realty, it's very simple. Just text me directly at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. If you're ready to join eXp Realty, or frankly, if you're just interested in getting started learning more about eXp Realty, text me directly at 512-758-0206, and I'll get you going in the right direction. Action. Do not wait on this because what you don't want to do is have all of a sudden your cash flow be interrupted, have all of a sudden realize what we were telling you is true, and then you wishing you would have made these expenses of reducing or you would have made these changes to reducing your expenses sooner because then you're essentially you are catching the falling knife. All right. Next question. I think we've covered I these, think right? I think that we are there. I think we're at the What new line. opportunities will arrive? No, oh, that's worth mentioning, that. right? Yeah. So generally speaking, the winners going into a housing correction are not the winners coming out of a housing correction. And it's because the people that uh, essentially, generally speaking right now, you're seeing a lot of people that have been able to sell real estate and they think they've been doing it based on skills, but they've been doing it mostly on buying business. They're buying their leads. They're paying ridiculous referral fees. So what happens during a housing recession when the listings start sitting on the market longer, when their expenses actually increase because of inflation, not decrease, and their cash flow slows down, they and they don't change fast enough, exactly what I was just saying, those people who were the big winners all of a sudden aren't the big winners anymore and a new generation of agents start creeping in. And that is absolutely what's starting to happen now, going back to the point I was making about millennials. That's right. So yep. it's time to take action, guys. Don't sit on this information. We largely took the education route with you today. We talked about a lot of different topics. We know that this stuff is on your mind. We hear you talking about it. We're trying to get you to be very confident and competent about what's going on out there. That way you can take the best care of yourself and your family. So if you need help, you can join our coaching. If you have questions about eXp, we'll help you with that too. So we have the last question we had, and this is where we're going to round the bend today. So what are Julie and I's predictions? What's going to happen? We think the winner, the peop, essentially the new generation of real estate winners, they're going to start being known over the next 12 to 24 months. We do think real estate is going to be forever be the essentially the greatest wealth creator for normal humans on planet Earth. For sure. If you buy a house, even in a time like this, because of rising interest rates, tie in a long-term uh, 30-year fixed rate mortgage, uh, inflation is going to be your friend overall, right? Now, will there be a hypothetical uh, point where inflation is not your friend? Of course, but will you still have a house to live in? You will. Will the house be less per month than had you been paying rent? Yes. And these are the that's this is the miracles. This is the strange time we're in right now. Now, even if the Fed rises rates, at some point the market's going to slow down. But Julie and I aren't even believing their interest rates are going to go up by two uh, you know basis points by the end of the year. We don't believe it's going to happen because we think that there's going to be so, an inflationary time. There will not be a rise of interest rates. The Fed's going to back off. The war in Ukraine gets worse. The Fed's going to back off. They're looking for excuses not to raise interest rates. But what do Julie and I think is going to happen? We do not think there's going to be hyperinflation. We think there's going to be stagflation. Yes. So what does that word mean? Stagflation. Stagflation is when the economy has inflation increasing at the same time that economic output has become stagnant. Generally, stagflation occurs when the money supply is expanding while supply is being constrained. And supply can be constrained for lots of different reasons. Today, we're seeing the effect of supply chain interruptions, rapid increase in oil prices, uncertainty in the Ukraine-Russian war, and other factors. So how would stagflation be bad? Well, it's kind of a contradiction because slow economic growth typically leads to an increase in unemployment, but not necessarily rising prices. And this is why stagflation is considered bad, because an increase in the unemployment level results in the decrease of consumer spending power. Then you add runaway inflation, and what money, cons what money consumers do have is still losing value as time goes by. Less money to spend and the value of money is in decline. That's bad. So you might ask, how do we get rid of stagflation? Well, there isn't an obvious cure. Economists seem to agree that productivity must be increased so that the growth in the economy happens. If the growth happens without inflation, then monetary policy can tighten up again. This is all hard to control, so they do say the same thing, try to avoid stagflation in the first place. And this is why you see them being proactive. And this is also the reason why the powers that be will not use the word stagflation right. because they know that there is no easy solution to it. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty much your worst case scenario. We don't think there's going to be hyperinflation like in Venezuela or anything like that. Uh, so where do you do with this information? Here's your big takeaway. We are in what is going to continue to be one of the best real estate markets of our lifetimes. Uh, 
not despite, but almost because of some of these external factors, because we have many things going for us right now. First of all, we are in the greatest country on planet Earth. There's no doubt. I, I mean, how would you like to be over in the Ukraine or Europe right now worried about some, you know, jackhole throwing some missile into your backyard? Mm -hmm. We don't have that problem unless, you know, Canada decides to, you know, muscle up. <laughs> I don't think that's going to yeah. happen. Right. So right now we are in the, you know, a very blessed place on the planet. And we are in a very – there's other things that are uh, happening that you cannot ever uh, underestimate. Uh, Harry S. Dent, read his books, right? Listen to his podcast. He talks about demographics. He's a demographer who turned into an economist, which is fine. But the demographics right now are going to lead to an increasing demand, uh, level of demand that's been unprecedented in all of humanity. And, yes, I'm talking about the baby boomers. Yes, I'm talking about the millennials. There is a wealth transference that's going to be happening as baby boomers go to – you know, baby boomer heaven. That's right. As they go to baby boomer heaven, there's a wealth transference where they're going to start leaving money and assets to their children. That's never happened before. That money right now is tied up in baby boomer assets. And when that money starts transferring to their kids, those kids are obviously going to reinvest it. They're going to spend it. This is all things that are happening in the next 10 years. That money is going to be uh, passed down. Those assets are going to be inherited no matter what's happening around planet earth. That is going to be a massive continued uh, ever increasing, uh, you know, wave of, of of economic opportunity. Well, it gets down to simple supply and demand at the end of the day, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, so even if you did wake up with more inventory tomorrow, the demand is absolutely there, and I would uh, argue that what you just said makes the demand even increasing. So your job as a real estate professional is to have the supply that somebody wants because the listing agent always wins, don't they? And you have technological revolutions that are Huge. going to do nothing but – You know, we, you and I talk too endlessly, but we haven't talked about it in a while. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk and Starlink and you have all these other things that are happening – they're going to make it like some of you are thinking, well, if all these people want to buy houses, where are they going to buy them? Well, they don't necessarily have to buy them in Chicago or Miami or these densely populated areas. They can now, because of the flexibility that technology is allowing all of us to experience, they can now live in areas that would have been considered rural before. We saw in our own little Murphy, yep. North Carolina, which is literally one of the most isolated places – Laura, Tim and Julie aren't introverts – it's one of the most <laughs> isolated yeah. places – in the United States, look at Murphy, North Carolina, look at it on a, uh, on a uh, Google Earth, and all you're going to see is trees. Yes, right? super remote. Yeah, and we have to go out of our way to see a human when we're there. True. Yeah, and for us, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> but anyway, back to point. Even in Murphy, North Carolina, where it is two hours from anything, a uh, Costco is two hours away. It is still uh, – the properties have in, uh, increased in value over the last 18 months, maybe 24 months, by more than 50%. In the history of Murphy, North Carolina, that has never happened before because what's happening? People are leaving these other areas and they're moving to Murphy, North Carolina, whereas maybe that was the place that they dreamed of living someday when they didn't have to work anymore because now they can yep. use Starlink or these other technologies. There's so many other things that are happening simultaneously technology, demographics, all these other things. I mean, we could talk about crypto, blockchain, all these other things. So when someone says what happened before will happen again, you need to really wonder what their motivation is. And don't be surprised if they're trying to squeeze you into a landing page to sell you something, because that <laughs> is almost always what fear mongers are trying to do. They want to get control of you because you lose control of your ability to think and, and essentially take action if you're living in fear. That's what the news is all about. That's what the media is all about. You can't be all about that because you got to remember what Julie and I said a second ago, the greatest uh, essentially wealth creation opportunity is right here of not just your lifetime, but maybe of humanity is right here in front of you because of all these things that are people are fearful of. Look for the opportunity. Don't follow the herd. The herd is almost always wrong, especially in times like this. So keep all these things in mind. You guys are in blessed places in a blessed industry. Now make sure you become the best version of yourself as a real estate practitioner. Hopefully we answered these questions completely let us know what you guys think message us on instagram message us on you can text me at 512-758-0206 we look for inspiration from you based on your questions and your feedback we always are encouraging whatever you guys have to say please do not live in fear 
Please step away from the CNN and the Fox News. Please focus on what your highest, truest purpose on this planet is, which is to be of service to other people. Hopefully, Julie and I will just were just service to you guys, making you feel educated, motivated. Now get into action. And one of the first things we ask all of you guys to do is to give us a five-star review on iTunes and leave us some nice comments. We certainly appreciate your continued support of keeping this the number one listened to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. Have a fantastic day.